The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. An announcement we're going to be doing the modules this week and Molly has an announcement to make for us Molly let me introduce who Molly is first of all for the Ustream people in particular we were when we for seven years Jennifer and I travel up in the New England area church to church and we were in this little church where it was in a basement and you couldn't stand up all the way and I'm only 5'8 and I couldn't stand up under this, in this little church's basement, although they had a sound system of last year, right? <laughs> but anyway, we were in this place, and, and, and God literally gave me a word of knowledge. Uh, I was probably working Jennifer to death, because we were, we were ministering seven days a week in order to make a living tr- uh, itinerant. You, you don't just do Sunday. Uh, and I felt like Jennifer was getting tired of all that traveling to and from, two and a half hours to this church, two and a half. And... This lady walked in that little church in Boston and God spoke a word of knowledge. He says, you can trust that woman. And we're going, okay, I've never saw her before in my life. I don't know what her name is, but you can trust that woman. And so later I got real brave. I'm very overprotective of Jennifer. But uh, I said, Jennifer, maybe you need to go do some girl stuff with that lady over there. That was like releasing your child to an unknown. And it was like, and so what did Jennifer do? They went shopping. And then Jennifer says, oh, we had fun. Would you like to come back to the cottage and get some ministry? (laughs) That's Jennifer. (laughs) All right. Do I need to say anything else? No, she said, um, do you want to come back and deal with roots? (laughs) And I go, okay. (laughs) I didn't know what I was getting into. That was like 16 years ago. So um, a number, I just want the Ustream people particularly to know that a, young, a number of um, Bible school students want to attend Module 1, which is going to be taught by Dennis and Dr. Jen um, in a week, the end of February, but again in the end of March. And um, these students need scholarships to attend. So if you've benefited at all from the books, the DVDs, uh, any of the um, teachings here, and gone to the modules yourselves, This is an opportunity to donate so that some others could take advantage of what God is doing here. And um, the way to do it is to go to forgive123.com and press the donation button of any amount. But actually what you'll be doing is taking what God is doing here and, and in their hearts to the nations. So that is not a small thing. And I, and I want the, especially the Ustream people to know that this is all a part of TEAM, which is the uh, Training Embassy for Advanced Ministry, T-E-A-M. But it also is totally equipping all missionaries, because these are missionary students. And um, just an add-on, there are approximately 50 people in this company of believers that have accomplished, out of devotion and love for our Jesus, very much. So we want you, you streamers, to come on and be a part of that. Thank you. So let's pray for this morning's message. But God, you who began a good work in Dennis, you're going to continue that good work. So help him out this morning and let him release that which is relevant, that which changes lives, that which is a blessing to the people of God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Relationship, relationship, relationship. I don't care what we preach, we're going to get relationship in there. Because without relationship, you don't have much in Christianity. You've got dead letter. And we want to be living epistles. We want the truth and the reality of Jesus to be written on the tablet of our heart. And the highest form of communication is to express someone. Did you know that? Jesus said that to Philip. They said, show us the Father. He said, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The highest form of communication is to express the Jesus in us. To a world around us and here's some things that uh, 
sometimes trouble people, but when we teach on relationship, I'm reminded of the fact that uh, the way you treat God is the way you treat people. The way you treat people is the way you treat God. And don't argue with that. See me after the service if you want to argue with that. But the way you treat people is the way you treat God. The way you treat God is the way you treat people. We can no longer say, I love God. It's these Christians I can't handle. All right? Or these non-Christians I can't handle. In reality, the way you treat God is the way you treat people. Uh, so uh, in light of that, I felt like God really laid on my heart to cover uh, the subject of authority. It's been uh, for a couple of weeks now, I've had a particular... Uh, burden to understand spiritual authority as well as positional authority. You know what I mean by positional authority? The title, the place, the station in life. Uh, there's basically in the Bible, there's four basic authority structures and the Bible's quite clear on all of them. There's the church itself, there's business, there's government, and then there's the family. And God has clearly laid out his structure for those authority structures. But there's a difference between spiritual authority and positional authority. And as kingdom people, we want to move toward influence with God or true spiritual authority. God wants both. Doesn't he tell you to honor those in authority? Even some of the evil ones, right? You're to pray for them, correct? So, uh, positional authority and spiritual authority. And scripture's basically telling us to honor both because they've been placed there by God and he really wants us to move with spiritual wisdom and insight. Uh, there's, a, there's a saying, uh, I forget the author of that book that we read some time ago. Was that uh, Thomas Sowell? Sowell. Thomas Sowell. Uh, we read through some of his books and he made one statement that never left me. And that was basically that intellect, you know, we, we exalt intellect. Intellect minus good judgment is foolishness. So you could have a high IQ and do foolish things, can you not? You could have a high IQ and make poor decisions. A high IQ minus good judgment equals foolishness. And even in the Bible when it's called a self-confident fool, the fool is said in his heart, that self-confident rebel most of the time is because they're rejecting the wisdom that comes from God. It has nothing to do with their intellect or their mental capacity. But intellect plus good judgment is wisdom. And wisdom is the application of truth. And when it's properly applied, when you're led by the Spirit and you're in the right place at the right time, I mean, you can't lose. Uh, that's, that's the beauty of it. But in Proverbs 29:18. If we're going to understand, uh, I'm just titling this authority because it's going to be kind of vegetable soup on the subject of authority, understanding positional as well as spiritual authority. But where there is no redemptive revelation, the people cast off restraint, Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no redemptive revelation, other translations say where there's no prophetic vision. Without a vision, the people perish. But it's a prophetic vision. Uh, many people establish goals in their life, but goals don't necessarily point to true north. How many know that? You can have all the goals in the world, but they're not all God. All right? But a redemptive revelation means that God has placed within us a capacity to fulfill the purposes for which he created us. And it will always include people. Destiny always includes people. So where there is no redemptive revelation, the people cast off restraint. So understanding that revelation is significant. Now, before I get to the four points of authority structure that I feel are significant, I'm going to give some, some basic concepts just to throw out there for those that want to take notes and study uh, till next Sunday. Anybody want to study till next Sunday? All right. I'm probably going to give you more than you can handle at this point. But... In understanding that we need revelation, not just good goals, that we need insight. Remember uh, Matthew 16, where it says, but who do you say I am? Remember Jesus saying, who do you say I am? People say you're John the Baptist. People say you're a liar. You know, Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And how did Jesus answer him? He said, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father. He was saying that, and upon that rock of revealed knowledge, upon that rock, 
I will build my church. I'm going to build my church on the reality of knowing me, of revelation knowledge of Jesus. Revelation of knowledge, I will build my church on that realm. So it's a building block. And that apart from revelation, you don't really know him. He wants a revelation of Jesus. The book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus with all of the explanations and all the teachings you hear in the book of Revelations. Bottom line, it's a revelation of Jesus. And the more that we, we enter into that subjective experience of knowing him, um, I saw that your level of revelation will equal your spiritual influence. Now I'm talking positional authority, now I'm talking spiritual influence. Your level of revelation will determine or is equal to your spiritual influence. So what does that tell you? It tells me that you need a legitimate experience in Jesus. You need to know him intimately, intimately, personally. And to the degree that you know him, it will determine your spiritual influence. You want influence with God? You need to know him. That I might know him. That I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with all the wonders of his personhood. I fell in love with that as a baby Christian and it means it's more to me now than it did then. The amplified version of Philippians 3.10. That I might know him. That I might pro it's a progressive revelation and I don't mind that it's a progressive revelation because what's available depends on, on your attitude of pursuit. This is not a casual walk in the park for me. For me, this is a life endeavor. And if I've strayed and fallen away from it in any given time, I always knew that that was the road, that was the railroad track to getting back up and on with life, was that I might know him, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with all the wonders of his person. That's who I say he is. I say, I am that I am. What I am is that I am. Whatever you, whatever you need, I am that I am. All right, so point number one on understanding revelation is your revelation is directly proportional to your spiritual authority. How much spiritual authority you have directly proportional to how well you know him. Secondly, your level of revelation is dependent upon your gifts and callings. The scripture says in, in Romans 12, so we being many are one body, individually we're members of one another. Having then gifts differing, do you believe that we have gifts that are differing from one another? But they've been apportioned by the Spirit of God. So a great deal of your revelation. I watch evangelists read the scripture and they see the evangelistic flavor in everything they read. You see an apostle, a prophet, they see from that viewpoint. So the gifts differ accordingly, but your level of revelation is proportional to your gift and calling. By the way, we're going to get into this later, but the purpose of the church corporately is that in, a, in a basically Ephesians 3.10, it says the comp, this is amplified. I like amplified because it spells out some of the things that we gloss over. Amplified. It is basically the purpose is that through the church, who's the church? All of us, right? That the complicated, some of you are really complicated, but... We're going to return to the simplicity of Christ no matter how complicated you are. I used to use that in a counseling term. and It was a technique for people that came in and they wanted to overwhelm me with their how complicated. It's going to be really hard to minister to me because I am so complicated. And I'm going, well, I said, but we're going to deal with root issues. Roots are simple. Roots are either rooted in pride or rooted in humility. You're either rooted in God or rooted in Satan. What do you want? And then all of a sudden, they weren't so complicated anymore. I'm a complicated person. Yeah, but we're going to return to the simplicity of Christ, and roots are simple. We're going to be rooted in God or rooted in, in, in the world of flesh and the devil. Where are you going to be rooted in? Pick. All right. But this complicated, many-sided, actually multicolored, multifaceted wisdom of God in its infinite variety and innumerable aspects might be made known to angelic powers, rulers, authorities, principalities, powers in the, in the heavenly sphere. I just love that because what the Lord showed me was that, that I might know him. That when you know him, it's like he shines the light of his face on your spirit. Right? Isn't that the scriptural? In the face of Jesus Christ. Face meaning spirit. Face to face is spirit to spirit. It's not face to face here. Face to face is spirit to spirit. That's how we know him, by the spirit. And when he shines on 
us a particular attribute of him. And is God multifaceted? <laughs> He's like a diamond with infinite numbers of facets. And so this diamond swings, and when that light shines on our heart, we get one facet. That's why I think they're doing it in heaven. They're going, holy, holy, because the, the infinite, no, you're never going to be bored because there's going to be aspects of the love of God and the nature of God and the person of God that he's going to continually sh shine on your heart. And you're just going to go, holy, holy, for the rest of eternity. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Now live in that level of joy and anticipation and expectation. Absolutely no boredom. No sitting on a cloud playing a harp. Get that out of your mind. That's a stronghold. Cast that thing down. That's not the way it is. But God's saying that even here on earth, that the grace of God has been divided among us individually as he sees fit. As he sees fit. It's like the dancing hand of God chose to gift you differently. And he made you significant and different in a unique way to express back into the heavenly realm, to the saved, to the unsaved, to, to demons and to angels alike, to demonstrate the manifold, multifaceted wisdom of God. So we corporately are like a reflection of that diamond. And to the degree that he has shined on our hearts, that particular multifaceted, actually multicolored is in one translation, actually says this multifaceted, manifold wisdom of God, manifold, many colored wisdom, is we reflect back that beauty. I think even in the, in the natural, you know, they're really pushing in, uh, in the jewelry stores, you know, orange diamonds, pink diamonds, red diamonds, purple diamonds. And I'm saying, just think what we must look like in that there's colors that we haven't even imagined that we are reflecting back to principalities and powers. All right. But you can only, ref you can only give what you've received. So therefore, that progressive revelation that I might know him, that you want different aspects uh, I don't know where I learned it, but as a baby Christian, I think I was reading something about Charles Finney. But anything the Bible said Jesus was, I, I want to know you like that. I want to walk in that. If you're my shepherd, I want to know what it is to be a sheep. I want to know what it is to be a shepherd. I want to know you intrinsically in that nature. I want that nature written on the tablet of my heart. I want it written there to where I owned it because unless you own it, you can't really reflect it. You can't give something you don't have and you can't receive something you're not even open to, right? So understanding revelation before we get to the good part, your level of revelation will equal how much spiritual influence you have, how much your level of revelation is according to your gifts and callings. You're going to reflect it basically the way God made you. He knit you together in your mother's womb with a specific plan and a purpose for you. And to the degree you cooperate with that plan and purpose, you reflect the principalities and powers according to your gifts and callings. The third level of revelation is according to your ability to hear. <laughs> Isn't that something? How many have read the parable of the soils in Mark 4? Right? Right? It's basically saying that take heed what you hear because with the same measure you use, it's going to be measured to you. And to those who hear, more will be given. How do you get more then? I believe you've got to listen and obey to get more. If anyone will do his will, he shall know. Oh, but I want to know before I do it. It doesn't work that way. How many people I've seen struggle? Oh, God, just tell me what. How about do the last thing he told you to do and obedience has a way of moving forward and upward. And the, and the lamp unto your feet has a way of you take one baby step of obedience. You will build authority to take the next step and the next insight. But some just want to sit and wait for that thing down the road to be all fully explained before I try anything. But that's not the way it works in the kingdom. John 7:17. 7, if anyone will do my will, he shall know. Do the last thing he told you and you'll know more. Psalm 40, verse 6, as a baby Christian, when I was inquiring about uh, revelation and, and, and deepening that intimacy with God, he gave me one verse in the Amplified, Psalm 40, verse 6, and he said, sacrifice and offering you do not desire, nor do you have delight in them, for you have given me a capacity to hear and obey. And I was a hyperactive child. I was a hyperactive Christian in the initial years. And out of that hyperactivity, he taught me to sit still. And I didn't like that. But he, because he says, what you're trying to do is you're trying to do in works. 
and service for me and it's not the sacrifice and the offering that I want. What I want is you to listen. That Dennis, I know you're a talker but you don't have anything to say until you've heard something. So that meant he was gonna do the talking and I was gonna do the listening. Not very convenient for a talker, all right? I must have got that from my father. My mother used to say that to my dad all the time. She'd say, my dad, I, I did the disc training uh, for him and he scored higher on the verbal than anyone I had ever done. He was like off the charts. And I'm going, is this even possible? Did I even score this sheet right? But she would say, Lloyd, if you would just listen, you might learn something. I heard that my whole life because my dad would just talk, 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 talk. My, my mom used to get nervous watching my dad go outside the house because he would be talking to the neighbors and she was always sure he was revealing something that she wouldn't really would have <laughs> kept to the rest of the family. And she goes, oh, Lloyd, she goes, she sees him out there talking for an hour and a half to the, to the neighbor who was a psychiatrist. My wife, oh, geez, he's a psychiatrist. There's my dad out there going, ah, da, 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 da. And then he would come in and invariably, when he would come in, she'd go, Lloyd, what were you saying to him? And she, nothing, nothing. Isn't that funny about talkers? They could talk all day long and then say, what'd you say? Nothing. I didn't say anything. All right. But your level of revelation is equal to your ability to hear. And in Mark chapter 4 is a good example. And then when God began to train me, uh, I guess nowadays we have names for that stuff. I didn't know it. I was just a young Christian who basically God said, I'm going to take to the school of the spirit. But I guess now they would call it a contemplative. He taught me to shut up and listen. And later in the church, they, they call it soaking. But soaking for me was like, well, that's being with him. That's prayer. Prayer is being with a person. Prayer includes talking, but prayer is not talking. That was the truth. He was trying to get into a talker. You know, you can say all the right answers and with your lips you praise me, but your heart's somewhere else. I want your heart. Then you have something to say that's got substance attached to it. So your level of revelation is equal to your ability to hear. And what he used on me was, was basically that I'm going to give you the tongue of a disciple. And I'm going to teach you how to speak a word in season to them that are weary. I'm going to awaken you morning by morning. I'm going to awaken your ear to hear as a disciple. So in other words, I'm the teacher. I don't know that if a talker really likes that concept. I'm the teacher, you're the student. I do the talking, you do the listening. But how many have gotten away with that at school? Where you went into the classroom and you talked through the whole class and at the end of the class you asked the teacher, uh, by the way, did you have anything you wanted to say? That wouldn't work, would it? I, it doesn't work that way with God either. He's the master, you're the student. And I, it took time for me to learn that because I'd have rather lived with the promise boxes and just pull out all the promises and tell God what I wanted. Isn't that interesting we don't have commandment boxes? We should have little piggies with the commandment scriptures in there. Or put on the refrigerator, my favorite verse for kids. You know, the child that mocks his mother and disobeys his father, the ravens of the field shall pick out his eye. <laughs> That'd get the little ones uh, some attention, huh? How come nobody puts those on the refrigerator? They put all the cutesy poo stuff on there. Huh? But anyway, your level of revelation is equal and proportional to your ability to hear. The fourth point, your level of revelation is equal to the size of your heart. How big is your group? Do you know that in the unsaved world, they can make their uh, immediate family their entire life? Bless us for no more. Unsaved people can do that. Christians can do that as well. God's basically saying, you need the Jabez prayer. You need to say, enlarge my boundary. Let me be more inclusive. Uh, uh, that must have been a shock even to his disciples when Jesus said, this is my mother, my brother, my sisters. They who do the will of God from the heart. He saw family and he honored his family. But he also showed that he honored beyond his family those who would do the will of God from the heart. And it was very inclusive and not exclusive. So the fourth level of revelation is increasing the size of your heart and increase your territory. But I suggest that you don't ask for greater influence, that you ask for a greater, larger heart, and the influence will come out of that, all right? There's two different types of revelation. We're still not at my message yet. I just want to give this in advance. Um, 
if God could take me to this school for this purpose, then he can take you to school for this purpose. But I want you to understand authority, but I want you to understand it properly. And understand even the types of revelation. There's two types of revelation in particular, and that is dimensional revelation and directional revelation. That sounds real complicated. Dimensional revelation is nothing more than what we've all been called to do. And in Galatians 1, 15 and 16, um, Paul described it. It said, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb, and guess what? Every one of you has had a mother. I don't care. You can argue with me, but you have. Every one of you has been born of woman. Okay, but it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, his empowerment, to reveal his son in me. Do you know you've all been called to that? That's your prime directive? That you've been called from your mother's womb to the intent that you would reveal his son, Jesus, in you. That is dimensional revelation, and you can go for that with all your heart, with all your soul, or you could treat it flippantly and lightly and barely apply yourself. But everything we teach is how to make Jesus Lord. And if that's the case, then you're going to pursue. And it says, and he even goes on to say, that it pleased God, when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach. Preach was the end result. What, is, what are you preaching though? You're not preaching about him. You're preaching from the substance of him being revealed in you. In other words, you own it. You've got substance. Uh, Wade Taylor used to say uh, that you can have an anointing to fix your mouth to preach. But it's the substance of the transformation and the character that comes forth that can be imparted and deposited into the lives of other people. I don't want an anointing for revelation if it doesn't change me. If I ever go to heaven and have this visitation, I come back down here and tell you about it, if I'm not changed, you have permission to slap me, all right? Because that revelation should be for transformation, not for information, all right? And so that level of revelation is dimensional. There is, however, directional revelation. And the Lord said uh, to Paul, uh, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles, to whom I now send you. I'm sending you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God, that they might receive forgiveness of sin and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith. And then who was he talking to? King Agrippa. He said, therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. So there's two kinds of vision here. One was that I was called to have Christ in me and to reveal him. But I was also called to minister life to other people, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. He, he stayed so focused on his God commission, he didn't get sidetracked by goals. That was the first thing that I learned as a freshman in college, was I went in the cafeteria and everybody was talking about their goals. And I doubt if any of them really knew, a small percentage knew what they were going to do, right? That's why they're in liberal arts anyway, most of them, because they, I'm going to try everything till I find myself, you know. It's either that or go to California on a Harley to find yourself. And then you get there, you find out I'm still the same person I was when I left, all right. Now, now we're going to get to the meat of the message that has been stirring in my heart for a long time. The four levels of authority. And I want you to pay close attention to this because we're living in a generation where honor is a missing ingredient, unfortunately. And honor was when God taught me, he said, I'm taking you to the school of the spirit. And he wouldn't let me go to the Bible school I wanted to go to. And I had to do it all on my own. Poor me. Uh, but I fooled everybody. I took five different Bible courses. I took the Assemblies of God. I took the Faith Camp. I, I took uh, Baptist. And I took uh, Kingdom Camp. And then I studied the prophetic in the, uh, as a side issue. It was nice, though, when you got together with pastors. You could a lot of times troubleshoot semantical arguments that really, you're saying the same thing, but you're used to saying it that way, and you're used to saying it that way. And, you know, a lot of times they were in agreement and didn't even know it. All based on how they were taught to say it. But when God basically told me that I'm taking you to the school of the Spirit, 
the first thing that he taught me was, was to honor him as a person. If that is a foundation, what he showed me is the nature and the person of God is the ultimate authority. I've had, I've sat in groups of, of pastors and leaders that I actually thought some of them made, made the word, the word of God, the fourth person of the Trinity. That is not the primary. The primary is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. You need him and you need to know him intimately. He will not contradict his word, but the word of God, God, knowing God as a person, it says basically God is spirit. They that worship him must worship in spirit and truth. It's the spirit that bears witness because the spirit is truth. However, when he, the spirit of what? Truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority. For I rejoice greatly, brethren, when I came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. Now, I am totally confident that the word, the integrity of the word remains intact. And Jesus and his word are not going to contradict each other. But I also believe that we would be shocked at uh, the historical evidence. A watchman knee was a student of the word, but he ran across some Christians that didn't have a Bible. And he had a kind of a condescending attitude toward them. It's like, these are unlearned people. But what he was shocked as unlearned people who didn't have the scripture, who had a revelation of Jesus, he found them to be, have profound insight nonetheless. Of course, it needed to go beyond where they were. But he was shocked that out of that personal relationship of Jesus, how much insight they already had. So he could take them in and then place within them these four levels of authority. Now, if level, the first level that God taught me was, is you're going to know me. I am the word. And he even used the example in the word where he basically uh, showed me the second level. The second level of authority is the word. Is Jesus and his word are one, but Jesus, personal Jesus, must trump word. Otherwise, you could be an unsaved person and a scholar in the word, and it could still be dead letter, couldn't it? All right. So the person of the Lord Jesus, the lordship of Jesus first, his nature, his person. Now, when I talk about his nature and about knowing him, it has nothing to do with this. It has to do with bearing witness to the spirit of truth. My spirit bears witness with his spirit that I am a child of God. Did you notice my head has to cooperate with that? My spirit bears witness with his spirit that I'm a child of God. As a matter of fact, uh, let me have my beautiful wife come up here. This is what we used to do when we traveled. How many have ever been to church? Maybe you've even struggled this yourself. I'm going to stand on this side of me, sweetie. Um, we used to do this. People would struggle with getting saved every week. Have you ever seen that? Or, I think I'm saved. Well, you read the word. You, you, you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. We found a way for them to, to basically validate themselves using their own equipment. Watch this. We would have them come up and they're going, I pray this prayer all the time. I think I'm saved. I don't know. They have mental assent. All right. Here's what we did. We put, have them put their hand right down here. This is the seat of the emotions. This is the door of the heart. This is the place where you either open or close to God or people. So we would say this, close your eyes. We had this happen at a module. The man was in the church 25 years. Oh, aren't you beautiful? Close your eyes. Now, I'm going to say a scripture in your ear, but you tell me not what you think about the scripture. You tell me how it resonates. Because this can tell truth and error, right from wrong. You have a conscience, and you've got a spirit, and you've got a Bible heart. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon me, that I should be called a child of God. How did that feel? Not what do you think about it. How did that feel? Good. Did that bear witness? That's what we call bear witness. It will either feel like truth or error. It will either feel good or bad. And then what we saw was that when the person says it feels good, that, we don't like to use the word feeling, but that feeling is assurance of your salvation. That's a title deed, and a title deed is a no-so. I'm sorry, it's a no-so. Okay? 
Now, we prayed with a man at Amajo who had been studied in the church. He studied everybody's material. He was biblically literate to the nth degree. We could have called him Dr. Fahrenheit. He was so educated. But down here, when I said, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed, that I should be called the child of God. I said, How does that feel in your heart? He went, Mmm, yuck. So he said, maybe let's ask Jesus to come in. 25 years in the church. Let's ask Jesus to come into your heart. Right down here, just relax. Open the door of your heart. Ask Jesus to come in. Cleanse you of your sin, and I will live for you and serve you all the days of my life. And all of a sudden, there's a countenance change, and he's got a smile on his face. And... Some of the men in the module told me, we saw him in the restroom and he's staring in the mirror, smiling at himself. He was glowing. <laughs> he, he just glowed. Glowing. Can you imagine being in the church 25 years? So the potential for mental ascent without a genuine experience is very possible. Fortunately, I hope it's not too prevalent, but it's very possible. Thank you, sweetie. Did you want to say something? Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say that, so if somebody is, that lacks assurance of their salvation, you could do it just like that. Have them pay attention to how it feels when you say a scripture. Mm -hmm. and because you have an anointing and it abides within. And you have the equipment that discerns truth from error, right from wrong. And if that's bearing witness to the spirit of truth, the spirit of truth will not put peace or bear witness in a positive way to a lie. <coughs> if the spirit of truth <coughs> would put peace on a lie, he'd be coming against his own nature, wouldn't he? He'd be coming against his very nature of being the spirit of truth. Truth and error is perceptible. Thank you. Okay, are you ready now? These four levels of authority, because I want you to understand the way we equip Kingdom Life Church and Full Stature Ministries, and it's kind of a paradigm shift for, for some. But first and foremost, I want you to know him. I want you to know him as a person and have his nature and have your own relationship with him and have that internal assurance of, of his presence. Secondly, the second level is the word. And when God was teaching me this and I said, well, uh, you know, I don't want to minimize the word. Am I minimizing the word by making such a big deal about you as a person? And God basically took me to Hebrews 4. And he said, the word of God is quick and powerful. It's living and it's active. It's living and it's active. Sharper than a two-edged sword, able to divide asunder between the soul and the spirit, joints and the marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And then verse 13 blew me right out of the water. Because I'm thinking word. The word of God is quick. I'm thinking scriptures. It's quick and powerful, sharper than a two. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And that just flooded with me. So it's like the scriptures, if we meet the author, if we meet the Holy Spirit, the author of those scriptures, if we meet him in those scriptures, then we are meeting the person of the Lord Jesus. We're meeting the living word. It's active. It's powerful. It will write on the tablet of our heart. We will become a partaker of the divine nature. There will be a residue of him to the degree that those scriptures have become absorbed and assimilated into our life. Not as information, but as experiential knowledge. And so I saw that level two is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. All right? So it's a person. And then I also learned, too, that in John, the Epistle of John, how many have heard this over and over again? In the, uh, that which was from the beginning which we have heard, that which we have seen with our eyes, that which we've looked upon and our hands have handled. This is my favorite. God took me to this one because I was concerned about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and the word. Is it true that the person trumps the word? Okay. And, but yet they should not be in conflict. They're one and the same. So I'm saying... Their eyes have seen, their ears have heard, and their hands have handled. They're talk John's talking about the earth walk of Jesus. 
That means when Jesus was there, his hands handled him, his eyes saw, his ears heard. But the thrill in that verse of scripture is after the resurrection, Jesus is no longer there in his earth walk. And they're still excited about saying, and we want you to have fellowship with us as, and make our joy fulfilled because we're still seeing him, hearing him, and touching him. That's what he's saying. It's like just because his physical body is no longer here doesn't mean that we're not enjoying that fellowship and our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son through Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, I'm still seeing, I'm still hearing, and I'm still touching him. That's the word. That's the way you need to look at the word. The word is an aspect of his nature that he wants to write on the tablet of your heart. He doesn't want you to just memorize it. He wants to write it on so that a residue of his nature and that you know him and have become a partaker of that divine nature. So the second level then is first is the nature of God as a person. Secondly, the word. All right. And it's a living word. The third level of authority if his person is level number one, the word of God is level number two, then level number three is basically your conscience. Did you know you have equipment in here that you're responsible for? God gave you a conscience, and your spirit knows right from wrong, truth from error. You have a responsibility now to have Jesus, the living word, Lord of your life. I'm not talking about Savior, getting saved, and fire insurance. I'm talking about making Jesus Lord in a practical, livable way to make Jesus Lord your will. Where's your will? Good. 98% of the church will point here for the will. Your will, this is the door of the heart. This is where you yield. This is where you open. This is where you experience. This is the epicenter. I believe your spirit goes head to toe, but this is the epicenter or the door. This is the epicenter where everything good happens and then informs the mind. And then all it's all encompassing. Everything enters the loop. Now, if God is basically saying that he wants your conscience to rule your will, Jesus wants to rule your will, then let the peace of God rule. The Prince of Peace, when he's ruling in a tangible way, peace rules. To the degree peace is ruling in your gut, Jesus is ruling. To the degree peace is not ruling, he's not ruling. He's still, you're still saved, but you're pretty much allowing something to come between you and him. And that's what he taught me. As a contemplative, he says, Dennis, even if you start to get upset down in your gut, you're letting something come between what you and I have together. Now, this conscience which knows the spirit of truth and the spirit of air, your spirit if you yield your will then the peace of God is ruling, Jesus is ruling and at, you're at least walking in the light that you have. But there's something you need to know about the conscience and its rule is there's four elements of obedience one you have within you. Now this needed to be in me, Dennis. When God was training me, he said, Dennis, you need to not only discern right from wrong, but there needs to be an inbuilt desire to become morally better. What's that mean? I mean, I knew guys that first got saved and they gave a big donation to the church, like it was like $6,000. And guess where they got the money? It was from the marijuana they had in their barn, all right? So did they have a pure heart at the time? Yeah. Did they learn a little bit more? Their conscience was clean. This is a great opportunity. I'm going to give this money to the building program. All right? So conscience and the rule of God needs to be understood that there needs to be an inbuilt hunger and thirst to be morally better in your beliefs and in your actions. In other words, you don't know everything you need to know yet. All right? So always know that your, your, your conscience might be okay at a given time, but you need to inquire of the Lord for more. And if you, want, if you walk in the light that you have, he'll give more light. There's no problem with that. All right? Do not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that word mind is nous in the Greek, which means mind, will, and emotions. There's no such thing as renewing your mind without the volition and the emotions. All three must be under the lordship of Jesus, not one. 
all right? They're like three little bad kids. They want to do what they want to do. The mind, will, and the emotion. All right? And the other two will follow no matter who's leading. All right? But all three need to be brought and, and under the lordship of Jesus. Now, these values need to be in the mind, yes, but they need to be written on the tablet of heart. Everything that we're teaching, uh, you already know they need to be in your mind. You need to know the word. You need to be biblically literate. However, this, these values, as it says, I will put my law on their minds, but I will write it on their heart. The error in the church, for the most part, is we've got more in our minds than we have written on our heart. That's turning the uh, hourglass upside down. There needs to be more written on the heart. We know more Bible than we're living. And the love of God constraineth us. That means it's pressing me on all sides, eliminating any other options. So uh, the third element for obedience is to maintain wholeness or integrity is if you are an epistle, minister to us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh that is of the heart. These values have to be obeyed to maintain integrity. How many know that? Because I think even things like, how many, how many believe that you're in your value system, at least in the mind, is to not use the Lord's name in vain? That's an easy one. But yet, people attach God to a lot of selfish activities. God told me. Every time someone doesn't want to deal with an offense, they, I've pastored long enough to hear this one. Every time they don't want to deal with an offense, they say, well, God's telling me to blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. That's using the Lord's name in vain. And, which brings us to another point. If these, these values are going to be maintained, then we're going to have to start allowing God to search our heart and be honest about some of these things and quit tagging. If, you know, if you're just going to do what you want to do, then do it, but don't tag God's name on it as if he would. We blame God for all of our dumb decisions as Christians, but we need to be a little more cautious of that. Let that be a little, get a little more convicted to not dishonor him because ultimately... In the school of the spirit, the very first lesson is honor my personhood. That means you can grieve me, you can quench me, you can resist me, but that hurts him. He's a person. A person has a mind, it has a will, it has emotions. Honor them. All right. Now, the action on these values needs to be consistent. However, being none of us are perfect, these actions, a righteous man may fall seven times, but he gets back up. I remember Bob, uh, Bob Mumford, uh, we were doing a seminar in West Point, the military academy, and uh, Bob Mumford gave that example with his fingers that I never forgot. He says, you know, he said, what does that mean that a righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up? It says, how come, how come you have three people and you've got this righteous man here and you've got these two unrighteous things and their life just seems like it moves along s smooth. Have you ever seen righteous, unrighteous people and their life just seems like oh, they're just being blessed all the time. Nothing ever happens to them. He says, he said, the thing to remember, and then the righteous man, it seems like boom, boom. One time after another, he gets knocked over, but he gets back up, he gets knocked over. He says, until you consider the fact that those unrighteous people, when they go down, they're down for the count, and there's no getting up. So that the righteous may fall many times, but you get back up. Matter of fact, you fall down, you get up, you don't wallow in it, you face your pain, and then you say, what am I supposed to learn from this? And then get on with life. Because you can learn from those times you've been knocked down. The fourth element is delegated authority. Oh boy, does that take the God, the God-like syndrome out of authority leaders? In the kingdom of God, under spiritual authority, delegated authority are fourth on the list. The personhood of God trumps them. The word of God trumps them. Conscience even trumps them. Do you know there's even times to disobey authority when it's matters of conscience, wouldn't it? So delegated authority, even though they like to be, Jesus said, not like in the world. Authorities in the world 
dominate. But he says, I want you to be servants. That in reality, delegated authority, though we're living in a generation where they lack the proper honor that is due, even double honor, according to scripture, nonetheless, they're fourth on the chain. Isn't that interesting? Some of you are going, yeah. No. Then that's an attitude that needs dealt with then if you do that. Be because God wants you to respect all of them, positional as well as spiritual authority. But they are fourth on the chain. Don't make gods out of anybody. They're not there for that. There should be coaches. So I'm saying all this. Here, you want to hear it? This is the part that's actually the message. All of that was fluff. Here is the real message that God showed me that when he took me to the school of the spirit, he taught me these four elements in that order. One, Dennis, my nature and my personhood is what you need to learn first. As you learn the word, secondly, I want a living word, I want substance, not information. I want the person, the word, I want you to live by your conscience, but never think you've arrived. I want the will of God to rule your conscience, but I want your, your, your moral insights to increase and pursue me. The third element. The fourth element is I've called you. 2 Timothy 1.11, Dennis, where I've appointed you a preacher, an apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles. So I knew I was called as a baby Christian. I didn't even know what those were. As a matter of fact, I was in a little Pentecostal church and I told them that I was, 2 Timothy 1.11, I was called to be a preacher, an apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles. You know that title, apostle, bro, just took, I didn't even know what it was. I was just telling you that was the scripture God gave me. And they took me out to the Brown Dermy for state to kind of let me down gently. <laughs> that, that's what you do with people like me that were loose cannons. You take them out for steak dinner. So if next time you're a loose cannon, to expect them to take you out to steak dinner to let you down gently. So they let me, they let me shake hands at the door because I was just a baby Christian. And I said, if that's all I can do, that's fine. I don't care. I like doing that. So I'd shake hands at the door. And the next thing you know, God gave me an article about you were a stranger and I took you in. And it went through the Pentecostal Evangel. It was in all their magazines. So no person is ever going to stand in the way of you being what God's called you to be, if the heart's right, right? But he basically told me that if these are the four elements and that delegated authority is fourth on the list, you don't have to get hung up on it. You, there's two sides of this extreme. One, there's those that are hung up on titles, and then there's those who have demeaned the titles to the point where they're non-existent. Uh, there's a balance. Truth is the tension between two extremes. There's a truth in there because it has to do with functioning properly and acknowledging significance and knowing that. That's a good thing. So here's what God said. Reevaluate your ministry, your pastorate, your traveling ministry, all the things that you do. If I taught you, Dennis, in the school of the spirit, in that order, personhood, the word, conscience, and lastly, delegated authority. Then he says, delegated authority, according to scripture, says that fivefold ministers are supposed to do something. They're supposed to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And I said, that's, that's an equipper. An equipper teaches them to do the work of the ministry. It's not the expert doing everything to you. You teach them to rely in self-governance on the gifting in you, correct? So then basically God was asking me, are you teaching them exactly the way I taught you? Are you teaching them they need to operate from the Christ in them, the hope of glory, as opposed to the Christ in you and let me do my thing to you? Hmm? And I said, yes, I am. And then secondly, the word. Are you teaching them that the word needs to be written on the tablet of their heart and not just memorized? When it's just memorized, they have the same answer. I already knew that. You ever run into Christian? I already knew that. You're not even done explaining anything. I already knew that. Those are usually the ones that really don't know. They know about it. The third element was conscience. And I'm saying, if... I were to start over again after 40 years in ministry, if I would start over again, I would start teaching people what? I would start teaching them their will. 
I still think it's the most undiscovered vacuum in the church that your will is not here, your will is here, and it's the door of the heart. And the things that you are open to, you are open to. The things you forbid, you forbid. It's really, it's really binding and loosing is not talking and yelling at the, in the atmosphere. Binding and loosing is what you permit and what you forbid. What you open to and what you don't open to on earth as it is in heaven. And I would teach on the will, and that's what we're doing. Because if the will is properly understood, you're exalting Jesus as Lord. Herein lies the problem, though. I'm going to read this. George Whitfield was an English Anglican preacher who helped spread the Great Awakening in Britain and especially in the American colonies. He was probably the most famous religious figure in the 18th century. Uh, newspapers call him the marvel of the age. How many have ever read anything by Whitfield? Any of the sermons, anything? You even know what I'm talking about. All right. George Whitfield did not, does not live in Charlotte. All right. Okay. <laughs> Whitfield was a preacher capable of commanding thousands on two continents through the sheer power of his oratory. In his lifetime, he preached 18,000 times to 10 million hearers. And before he toured, the colonies were complete. Virtually every man, woman, and child had heard the grand itinerant at least one time. Wow. So pervasive was Whitfield's impact in America that he can justly be styled America's first cultural hero. He brought a common salvation message to the colonies, Jesus above all, that cut across cultural, denominational, and state lines to make America truly, at that time, one nation under God. As believers. Now... I'm, he speaks in Old English here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase it. He was saying, well, I'll, I'll say it exactly the way he said it. Sermon 38, Sermon 38 whatever that is. You, you can Google that. But he was talking about the gospel. And he says, they talk professedly against inward feelings, which is what God taught me to preach and keep on preaching. I don't care if you're going against the stream. The church is taught against the emotions. And God didn't give you emotions to just ignore them or that they were all bad. I remember the little choo-choo train. Fact is the word of God. The coal car is, is uh, fact. Faith. Faith is the coal car that energizes the word. All you need is faith in the Word. You don't need those feelings. That's a caboose. We can just disconnect. And that's why we've got brokenhearted people throughout the body of Christ. Because they're basically wounded and don't know how to fix the wound. So we basically either shoot them or medicate them. That's really the only choices we have left. But he basically said, they talk professedly against the inward feelings and say, we may have God's spirit without feeling it which is in reality to deny the thing itself. And had I a mind to hinder the progress of the gospel and establish the kingdom of darkness, I would go about telling people that you might have the spirit of God without you ever feeling it. That's terrible, isn't it? Feelings, I don't know where they got this to where you can't talk about them in reality. And quite frankly, I get a little upset with men because men, you start talking, oh, emotions, those are for women. As Jennifer says, I see you on the road. You got more emotions than women on the road. What you mean is you don't have any good ones. All right? But you've got anger. And men, let's, let's get down into your language and not talk emotions. Let's talk stress. Come on, men. Stress. You know what stress means? You're being emotionally controlled by people and circumstances. That's not the lordship of Jesus. You cannot be at peace and trust God at the exact same time. Oh, come on, men. I'm getting a little tired of this machoism, huh? Did I say that backwards? You can't trust God and be stressed at the same time. Stress means you are being emotionally controlled. Jonathan Edwards, the great intellect, says the emotions are the gateway to knowing God. That when they saw the awakening, they saw the people that were moved to tears had the greater life changed. The people that remained unchanged pretty much remained unchanged. So don't poo-poo the emotions. We have a promise of being partakers of that divine nature, that we would be one with the Messiah Jesus, that when we will intimately know and experience God, yet Christians are denounced. Now look, historically, 
we're talking about positional authority and spiritual authority. Did you know some of the, some of the greatest lovers of God that had intimate experience with him were, cast, uh, were, were, were chastised by their superiors? Some even burned at the stake. And nowadays, if you really intimately know the presence of God, you're going to be considered new age. That's an easy thing to throw out there. Huh? I think Kenneth Hagin had it sarcastically accurate. He said he taught the word and the spirit, but Kenneth Hagin said that some people wouldn't know the Holy Spirit if he was wearing a red baseball cap and tennis shoes. You can know the word and not know the spirit. And what God wants is that there are two wings of the Holy Spirit that flies. You need the word and the spirit. Worship in spirit and in truth. And truth is actually reality. I want the reality of my Jesus and I want him Lord. And to have him as Lord, to maintain him as Lord, I'm going to have to get, understand the Holy Spirit much better as a person. I'm going to have to get to the place where I don't grieve, quench, or resist him. And ministers in particular are slandered as heretics or new age if they even suggest they can feel the presence of God. That's a historical truth. That's not something recent. That's something that's always, always happened. When Christians denounce inward feelings and say we may have God's spirit without feeling anything. That's denying the reality of the Holy Spirit and saying all we can know is mental philosophy. If I wanted to hinder the advancement of the gospel and help establish the kingdom of darkness, I would convince people that you don't have to presence or feel his presence. I can't imagine what that would look like. How about this one? I got the joy of the Lord by faith. I had the joy of the Lord by faith. I don't want that joy of the Lord by faith. Do you? I had the joy. I see people look depressed and they're telling me, I, well, I just got to have faith. I don't want what, whatever you've got, I don't really want. You keep it. Hmm? Yeah. So, close your eyes. I want us to memorize. Oh, yeah, I'm talking about everything about being partaken, but I want you to memorize that authority structure because if you pursued it, you're going to find a rapid advancement in the character development of your heart and life. Number one, that I might know you, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with the wonders of his person. Secondly, I'm going to pursue being a student of your word, and I'm going to know that word inside out and backwards, but I'm going to know the living word. I'm going to pursue that Jesus and his word are one, and that I'm going to know both of them intimately. And he's going to leave a residue of his nature on the inside of me, that I'm going to have Christ formed in me. And that as it's formed in me, I'm going to walk by my conscience with the will of God by having the peace of God rule in my heart as often as as frequently as I can and anything that that violates my peace I'm going to view it as something coming between me and my Jesus I don't want anything to come between what you and I have together Lord Jesus any negative feeling is coming between me and my Jesus and it's not worth it I release that and as far as delegated authority God, I don't ever want to lord over people, but I want to teach them to stand on their own two feet in self-governance more than I want them dependent upon me or any other leader. I want them to become independent just like I would for my children. I want them to stand on their own two feet and not depend on mommy and daddy after they're grown up and matured. I want the same thing in the kingdom of God. I want to see them stand on their own two feet strong in the Lord and the power of his might, grow in the grace and in the knowledge of God. I want them to uh, know what it is to have the peace of God rule in their hearts so that Jesus is Lord that in that day they're not going to say many have said to me Lord Lord did I not prophesy did I not cast out devils he said depart from me I knew you not you you went your own way and you work lawlessness you did only what you wanted to do and then put my name on it that's lawlessness I want to walk in obedience to him and that my conscience would reveal to me truth from error but always the lordship of Jesus and lastly I want to do just like delegated authority was taught. I have two purposes for fivefold ministry, says the Lord. And if you're called to fivefold ministry, you are to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, but you are also to bring them into a unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God. Father, that we might walk in a unity and a one accord, that we might get outside of bless us for and no more and get into the realm of the church at large, to be able to be connected. You know, when... 
way before we knew anybody. God basically said, Morningstar and Sid Ross Ministry in this area, and you're to be a friend to them. And I thought that was very interesting because I didn't know anybody, and neither one. And look, we have Julie here this morning, and Jennifer and I spent a lot of time with Sid and his wife. But that was all after God said it. Isn't that interesting? So maybe he that desires to have friends might have to show himself to be friendly. Have to kill some of us. But we just might have to do it. Huh? That's not a good translation for that scripture, really. But anyway, it fits. And before we close, I want to say this one thing. What doesn't work relationally? You want to hear what doesn't work? I tried it. I was in the Catholic school. I think it was first grade. And Dennis is a talker and a hyperactive kid. And he'd come home and every day my mom would say, if he made any friends? And I'd say, no. And this went on for a couple months. And she says, how come you keep saying no? Don't you try? I go, mom, I'm trying every single day. So a good mother, she says, uh, so tell me how you try. I go out on the playground at recess every day, and I go in the far corner where there's a tree, and I stand by that tree waiting for someone to come up and be my friend. Therein lies part of the problem. We could call it divine initiative. <laughs> people are waiting for people to come to them when in reality you need to take the divine initiative. Be friendly. Choose to open up into spheres bigger than yourself. Because your destiny will depend on people. I know you like to be a lone ranger, but I'll tell you what. In the kingdom, your destiny will always include people. Entertain them all as angels, because the people that were the most significant in my life, I had other people come up to me and said, I would like to choke them. Pastor, could I kill them? And I'm going, no, we can't we'll kill nobody. And those people turned out to be extremely important and significant in the future of what God had planned for us. Isn't that interesting? So, be nice to everybody. Bottom line. Father, seal this work by the power of the Holy Spirit. Teach us authority in our individual lives to respect and honor. Restore honor back and self-governance to into each and every individual believer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.